Okay, so this is uh, part two of our notes on the road to revolution. We're going to be examining primarily taxes, uh, the colonial response to those taxes, and how the colonists eventually declared independence over time. Um, first thing we need to address about taxes is, like I've said in class and told you numerous times, there is kind of a myth of this concept of uh, taxation starting the Revolutionary War and that being the single most important issue. We know that's not. Individualism had exploded in America. Uh, the main concern with taxation was taxation without representation. And then you can't forget the importance of salutary neglect, which might be the most important thing. The colonists were just used to running their own things and taxing themselves and so on and so forth. But because of the debt uh, brought on by the French and Indian War, England now had to step in and had to institute its own taxes. All right? The cost of the war was extremely high. All right? So that, coupled with the Chief Pontiac Rebellion and these constant Indian threats, England felt that the time – um, that, coupled with the Chief Pontiac's Rebellion and the French and Indian War and the debt that ensued because of that, England felt that the colonists had to be protected, soldiers had to be maintained in America, forts had to be built, and it just seemed appropriate that the colonists would pay for their own defense. So England's going to leave about 10,000 soldiers in America. I mean, you know, soldiers are expensive. You talk about supplies, you talk about equipment, you talk about uh, their pay, uh, feeding them, housing them, so on and so forth. Um, England has to take steps to provide for these soldiers. One thing they're going to do is they're going to force uh, troops to be quartered in their in co colonial homes, which is going to be uh, important in the long run, which we'll look at later. George Grenville becomes Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1763. Uh, at this time, uh, an average citizen in Britain was paying five times more in taxes than Americans were. Grenville is going to be the uh, Prime Minister responsible for, ta for uh, implementing the Sugar Act, which is kind of an indirect ta tax. It, uh, it taxes molasses and sugar. Later he's going to lower the taxes on molasses so uh, uh, to try to prevent smuggling, which uh, is what the colonists would do when taxation came about. They would smuggle in goods to avoid the taxes. But if you violated the Sugar Act, you were going to be tried without a jury and by a British judge rather than a colonial judge. So this was another way to try to deter colonists from uh, smuggling in goods and avoiding the taxes. Now, the Stamp Act is going to come about in 1765. It's going to be the second of the taxes. Um, this puts a tax on court documents, titles, playing cards, newspapers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically, anything that the uh, a stamp would go on that would make it an official document or official piece of paper would uh, constitute the right to tax it. Um, and this was primarily because of the money to cover those troop costs. Keep in mind, you know, soldiers are expensive. There was a similar tax in Britain. This was nothing new. This wasn't just dreamed up for the colonials, but you can guess they kind of uh, rebelled against it. They didn't like it. They protested, and they tried to boycott as much as they could. Ben Franklin actually suggested that Americans be represented in Parliament. This is going to be quickly rejected, but this just kind of demonstrate this, demonstrates this idea that we're, uh, we're used to and we've heard before of taxation without – I'll do the without symbol – without representation, and we'll just keep a rep there to make it short, but that's the concept you need to be aware of. Taxation without representation. Keep in mind Americans are individualists. They want representation in Parliament. They want to be able to dictate terms. They want to be able to fight for their own future. They just feel it's appropriate to be represented. Another policy right. that Britain is going to implement to try to uh, cover the cost of troops is going to be the Quartering Act. Uh, General Thomas Gage is the British commander in America, and he's going to force colonies to provide barracks and food to British soldiers. Um, and this could come in the form of putting soldiers in your own house and having to feed them. Uh, it's a concept known as quartering. And uh, even today, if you look at our Constitution, it's the uh, – I believe it's the Third Amendment. We uh, – the American Constitution outlaws this. It makes it illegal. So you can see this actually had a lasting effect with the Founding Fathers. They thought this was a, a heinous act. Because of the uh, implementation of taxes and the Quartering Act and so on and so forth, certain uh, groups of col colonials are going to form uh, secret organizations to kind of combat and organize resistance to these taxes. Uh, the most famous of which is the Sons of Liberty. It's a secret organization. Membership included people like Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Benjamin Franklin, eventually John Adams. These guys would go out at night. They would destroy British property that was being taxed. Uh, they would burn tax collectors in effigy. And when you see effigy, what that means is essentially a uh, a fake representation, kind of like a scarecrow or a doll that's supposed to uh, represent a tax collector. 
You know, think of the concept of a voodoo doll, how you got this little doll figure that's supposed to represent other people, and they would set it on fire as like this symbol that they're burning up a tax collector. Another thing the Sons of Liberty would do is organize boycotts. Um, the feminine counterpart of this, or the uh, the la the women the woman counterpart of this, is the Daughters of Liberty, who wove fabric for colonists. Uh, and this contributed to the boycott of English goods, because remember, America sent cotton off and then got clothes back. So they were actually doing their own fabric, weaving their own fabric. Now you can imagine the British reaction to this uh, Sons of Liberty and the boycotts, you know, is um, sort of interesting here because, you know, King George obviously sees that these taxes are not working, so he, he actually blames his minister. So if he fires Grenville, the prime minister, puts a new one in, uh, a new prime minister in charge, Charles Townshend. Now, they're going to repeal the Stamp Act. They're going to see it's a failed policy, it's not working, it's causing more trouble than it's worth. But keep in mind, Britain is still the sovereign. They're still in control, and they want to maintain this control. They don't want to let the colonists win. They want them to still pay their way. Keep in mind, it just seems logical. You know, you're putting British soldiers there to defend the colonists against Indians. Why shouldn't they pay for their own Prime defense? Minister Townshend is going to pass the Townshend Act of 1767, and this puts a tax on paper, paint, glass, tea, uh, things like that that's going to uh, – it's, it's, it's another one of those taxes that's supposed to kind of slide through and try to get at goods that have been smuggled. Um, Tea at this time is very popular. It's an empire drink. That's why even today, you know, the British Empire still drinks tea, uh, where Americans drink coffee. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this is going to lead to more and more boycotts, as you can imagine. Anything that's going to be taxed is automatically going to be boycotted. Uh, Boston and New York are going to be the heart of this. They're big cities. They're very urban. Uh, and the Sons of Liberty are going to be able to ferment there and to gather membership there. So the Britain has to uh, counteract this, and what they do is they station more and more troops in these areas, especially in the streets of Boston, which is going to lead to a very famous incident. Well, in 1770, Lord North becomes prime minister. He is automatically going to repeal the Townshend Act, but one thing he is going to do is keep this tax on tea. Keep in mind, Britain's in control. They're the sovereign, and even though they take a tax away because they see it's not working, they want to maintain their control and their dominancy. So now, you know, in, like leaving that. these taxes is just going to see more and more protests and more and more boycotts, and eventually, at, at times, it's going to spill over into uh, kind of an armed conflict. In March of 1770, British soldiers are standing outside their posts, essentially, and you have to remember these sentries, these soldiers standing at a post, they're basically on defense. They're on an armed guard, and they're supposed to react when people are resilient or militant towards them. Well, a group of protesters forms, and they start yelling, and they're throwing stones at the British troops. The troops have finally had enough. They fire into the crowd, and they end up killing five people, including Crispus Attucks, uh, an African-American that was in the crowd, becomes one of the first to die in the revolutionary struggle. Paul Revere eventually is going to come back and do an engraving of the events. Paul Revere is a famous person. We know him as one of the writers that went around warming, warning people that the British were coming. Now, Paul Revere was actually not even at the event, but of course, he's going to do the engraving just as if he were there. And this event is going to be labeled the Boston Massacre. Um, here is Paul Revere's engraving. And as you can see, this seems like a very uh, militant sort of thing where you have these British troops in a lot of battle firing off into the defenseless crowd. Um, and the reality is quite different. Now, Americans are... Colonials at this time are going to form certain committees to try to get the word out about Great Britain, about certain boycotts that they're trying to implement and British policy in order to reject it. Um, and this is going to be known as the Committees of Correspondence. Think of this as a 18th century Facebook or Twitter. Okay, uh, This is essentially a news feed. All right? They're throwing up things on the news feed. Tax on tea, boycott the tea. Uh, you know... Ta uh, stamp tax, avoid uh, avoid court documents, so on and so forth. Um, it's just a constant string of updates. Only this time, you know, it being in the 18th century, you can't just digitally put it in your computer. So you send out letters. Samuel Adams is going to get it all started in Boston. There's going to be committees all over the colonies, all the way down into Georgia, and their goal is to try to keep everyone up to date on resistance to the British. It's basically a live feed. All right, in 1773, Great Britain is going to pass the Tea Act. Now, this doesn't really raise the price of tea. You, what you had here is, if you remember Pirates of the Caribbean, you've got the East India Trading Company. All right, 
East India Trading Company. These guys had warehouses stocked full of tea. All right, they were running over and it was causing them to lose money. And Britain knows that they've got to get rid of it, or they're going to have a, a you know, a bad economic situation as far as uh, moving tea goes. So they kind of decide to create a monopoly. They do tax the tea, but because they have so much of it, they drop the price so low that the price, even with taxes, is cheaper than the American colonists can ta can uh, smuggle the tea in from D the Dutch. All right, I mean, the, the essential of the price was so low that you couldn't compete with it no matter what you did. Uh, but there is still a tax on it, okay? The tea act still implemented that small tax. Colonials are not actually dissuaded by this. They're actually persuaded to revolt against the tea. They think it's a bad idea. It really just, um, and like this says here, it's, it's trying to force Americans to buy the tea from the British. It's creating a monopoly. Americans don't like the monopoly. They don't like that small tea, tea tax. Now, the Sons of Liberty, at first, are boycotting all tea. They organize these boycotts, send the word through the uh, committees of correspondence, and it spreads like wildfire. Uh, one of the things that they do to boycott the tea is they actually, uh, Americans start drinking a lot more coffee. And this is why today Americans drink more coffee than they do tea, as opposed to the British. Um, so just kind of a fun fact in there for you. But Governor Hutchison is going to try to get around this tea tax. He's going to try to bring the tea in anyway, uh, you know, kind of force its moval. Uh, and then December 16, 1773, as one of my college professors told me, a uh, bunch of quote-unquote patriots and the Sons of Liberty sat around in one of their pubs having a meeting, probably drank way too much beer and ale, and dressed up as Indians, boarded a ship, and dumped a million dollars worth of tea. Years later, this is going to be known as the Boston Tea Party. Now, you can imagine if you wasted a million dollars of someone's money that they would probably be pretty mad at you. Uh, King George is pretty mad about this. He creates four new laws in response to what happened at the Boston Tea Party and that just tragic loss of money. He closes the Boston Harbor. So merchants are going to be basically out of business. Town meetings are prohibited. And keep in, uh, keep in mind, this is where you would see the Sons of Liberty at is in these small town meetings. Well, now this is prohibited. A new quartering act. You know, people keeping British soldiers in their houses and having to feed them. And here's a, a really interesting one, and this actually really – ticks off John Adams, our, one of our founding fathers, is that trials for capital crimes are going to be moved to Britain. Instead of trialed in America by a jury of your peers, it's going to be in Britain. Uh, colony, colonists are going to rename what is known as the Coercive Acts uh, the Intolerable Acts because they found Eventually, the colonists lie. are going to start to really just reject these acts. They're going to see that what's going on is really wrong. Uh, the committees of correspondence are doing a great job of rallying everybody throughout the 13 colonies. Um, and they're going to form what is known as the First Continental Congress. Okay, It's going to bring representatives from each one of the colonies up to Philadelphia in 1774. Um, all of them except for Georgia, actually, is going to be sending a representative. Uh, Georgia has its own unique reasons, but it's uh, essentially they just kind of go with the flow on this. you got to keep in mind, travel's hard, Georgia's a long way away, uh, and we'll get a little bit more in-depth as, uh, as why Georgia didn't go in class rather than on here. Mostly what the First Continental Congress uh, wanted, what their aims were, was a, a political compromise. Some were advocating representation in Parliament. Um, you know, Some were advocating extending olive branches to England and just coming to terms with the taxation. There were a few, though, that felt that enough was enough and they wanted some rebellion, but the majority were not ready to go that route just yet. They demanded repeals by the British. When we're talking about repeals here, they mean the repeal of the taxes. They're tired of the taxes. They want them gone. They want them over with. And the First Continental Congress ended their first meetings by stating that they will meet again if their problems are not fixed. As you can imagine, these problems are not going to be fixed. Now, something interesting is going to happen here. At this time, um, a lot of the colonials used militiamen, You know, kind of like we saw in the last of the Mohicans clips. Militiamen, or Minutemen, as they were called, um, could be formed very, very quickly and were formed on a town-to-town -town basis. I mean, that's why they're called Minutemen. It's because they could be formed up so fast and ready to fight. Well, General Gage, commanding officer in America, is going to order British troops to seize armory, armories of this colonial resistance. Uh, the colonials have been stacking up arms in certain areas, and Gage is going to march on it and take it. On April 18, 1775, 700 British soldiers are going to meet the Patriots, first at Lexington and then in Concord. This is where Paul Revere is going to have his famous midnight ride, warning the Colonials that the British are coming. But he's not going to shout the British are coming like we are often led to believe. He actually shouts the, the British when they first uh, run into the Patriots here or this colonial militia. I mean, they've got 700 soldiers. They're well trained. They line up with the Patriots. They fire at them. The Patriots run off and scatter. 
the British do what they were supposed to do. They march on the armory, but the army armory had already been kind of relieved. Uh, the colonials had got everything out, so they wasn't there. But they have to turn around and walk back. And as they're walking along this uh, lengthy trip, it's about 20 miles, colonials are going to show up, and they're going to start firing at them and shooting at them from the wood line all the way back to Boston. It's going to be kind of a, a, a bit of a one-sided thing because the colonials won't stand in front of them, and they won't fire conventional warfare. They fight kind of like Indians like we saw in the last Mohegan's clips. So along the way, around 73 British soldiers are going to die, um, and these are referred to as the battles of Lexington and Concord. These very well um, can be designated as the very first shots of the American Revolution. After these clashes at Lexington and Concord, the Second Continental Congress is going to be convened, and uh, this Congress is going to be going to agree to fight the British. Uh, they felt the British had attacked already at Lexington and Concord. This uh, Continental Congress is going to appoint George Washington, our first president, as leader of the Continental Army. Uh, he is a Virginia planner. He's wealthy, he, and he's uh, also well-established with, uh, with a lot of the founding fathers. Military clashes with certain uh, colonial militiamen started to break out everywhere, you know, so the, the revolution was pretty much on at this point, and there was no turning back. Some actually tried to petition King George for a peace. This is known as the Olive Branch Treaty, but it is quickly rejected by King George. Revolution just appears inevitable at this point. So the colonials have to follow suit. Thomas Paine is also trying to stir up the emotions of the revolution as this is going on. This is where you have his pamphlet published known as Common Sense. Uh, it's written in January 1776. He felt that leaders needed support, these continental figures, these founding fathers that are trying to advocate independence. They needed the support of the populace. So he writes this pamphlet where he criticizes the king, and he actually unites much of America to war. It makes people want independence. It's actually a really good piece of what we would call propaganda. But it's, I mean, it's, its historical significance is that it brings the masses, the populace of the group, the, you know, the the uh, the silent majority of America in behind the Founding Fathers and their revolutionary ideals. Congress is eventually going to approve independence, and they actually do it on the second, but they appoint a delegation to write a formal document of independence. Um, this delegation consisted of about five people, but the main member that we know in history is Thomas Jefferson, a wealthy planner and statesman from Virginia. Congress is going to approve the document on July 4, 1776. In the document, it basically gives this overall clause of grievances, a list of grievances against the king of different things that he did wrong, and that America is now independent of Britain, which is a pretty bold statement, and you can imagine King George is really going to flip out over this. Um, a lot of the ideas progressed or put forward in the document are from the Enlightenment era, which was one of the things we actually talked about. It gives credence to the Enlightenment being one of the founding principles that started the American Revolution. Um, John Locke's Life, Liberty, and Property, and property is going to be changed to the pursuit of happiness uh, by Jefferson, and that the government gets its power from the consent of the governed, which is uh, another one of the Enlightenment ideals. It, it kind of shows you where America's uh, founding ideology was on, individualism, all right, Enlightenment, individualism, not collective, not the uh, social contract that uh, – you know, Thomas Hobbes would show that a number of Brits thought that you should buy into, but this idea that everybody has individual life, liberty, and property. All right. And this is the end of our notes to the road to revolution. Uh, the next time we, uh, we do this again, we'll be looking at the revolution itself and uh, no longer its founding principles. All right. So look these over, take notes on notes, and uh, have a good day.